Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. Well, I want to thank you for joining us for this time of gathering around the table of truth through Facebook and YouTube. Those of you who are coming to us through those different methods, we honor God for you and we appreciate your commitment uh, to gathering with us, to fellowship in the word of God. We're going to pray and go right into our lesson. Father, we honor you for this time. We thank you now, Lord God, for all those who are joining in with me at this time and Father, I believe it's because they have a heart for you and they have a desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, you will cause your word to come with clarity and understanding through the demonstration and the anointing of your Holy Spirit, which I depend totally upon, Father, because I am who I am by your grace. I ask now that you will speak through my mouth and thank in the arena of my thoughts, Father, that the word of the Lord may come forth for your glory and for the enriching of the believers in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are ministering from the theme, Family Matters, and we define that as God's care, concern, and commitment to the families in the earth who places his rule and reign as the truth to guide the affairs of their families or their households. We, in our last lesson, we talked about family feud, and we defined that as not a game, but a gripe, grudge, and guilt that fuels family relationships and the health of those relationships that can create a hindrance to God's power working within that family. But we said that we want to be individuals in the family who don't point the finger at others, but first of all, to develop a attitude that is Christ-centered. The second thing we said, we want to develop an attitude that is self-searching. And we challenge ourselves with what I call some self-searching questions because when it comes to family, God is trying to do more within us who are people of faith, who are people who are in his family and now become an inroad or a way for God to have access through our prayers, through our uh, communication of his love and grace within that context of the family. In other words, God is using us in our families. And so we talked about developing a self-searching attitude. And then we said we have to develop an attitude that is light driven. Jesus said that we are to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Well, today I want to sum up this teaching that I have been sharing relative to family matters. And I believe that every born again believer, you and I, we want to see our families, our immediate family, our extended family, and even those beyond our families impacted for good and ultimately for the glory of God. And we want to do that in such a way whereby regardless of their behavior, because regardless of their rudeness, their recklessness, and their rambunctiousness, we can trust the power of God that there is nothing too hard for, Lord, for the Lord. I did a message recently, matter of fact, it was on last Friday on the Worship and Word Network work. I come on Monday through Friday from 1 p.m. to 1.30, and I did a message entitled Generational Blessings. So often in the body of Christ, especially when people start teaching about curses and things of that nature, believers, I'm talking about people who claim to be people of faith, they jumped on the horse of curses rather than focusing on the blessings, but those in that message, I talked about what generational blessings look like. Now that we are, are citizens of America, living in America, we have a certain citizenship right as being part of America. Even in the body of Christ, we are called to be citizens that our citizenship is in heaven. But while we're here in the earth, there are certain rights and benefits that come with our citizenship. Now, some people use it for good and some people use it for evil. Some people, you know, they try to take advantage of it and, and don't uh, honor uh, the intent of these uh, uh, rights that we have as citizens. But I say that to say this. 
that every believer, every Christian, we should want to work together for the good of promoting well-being among the entire family, whether they're in Christ or whether they're not in Christ. Our attitude should be we want to promote the well-being of the entire family. And I believe that if we're going to do that, there are certain things we're going to have to promote within our family. And one of the things is we're going to have to promote the value of knowledge. The Bible speaks of the value of knowledge as well as warns us against the negative application of knowledge. Within our families, we must aim to be conduits of knowledge in to create an environment whereby knowledge is expected, enjoyed, and empowering within our families. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 and 17, is where we find this word knowledge first presented by God in the creation of mankind. So in Genesis 3, 15 and 17, listen to this. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge, of the knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now we see that in the creation of mankind that God established with Adam and Eve a system of order. They were already in tech intellectually uh, able to connect with their environment. So there was, a, there was an element of intelligence already put within the human race. However, Satan offered them an alternative in disguising himself as a serpent to bring deception to Adam and Eve. And in this disguisement, he offered them simply self-fulfillment. In other words, God is not being fair. God is holding back on you. God was not holding back on them. God gave them everything they need to enjoy life, to enjoy fellowship with him, to be able to enjoy the environment that he had placed them in. But that's how the devil works. He come through a disguise, but his whole objective is to deceive. Now, because of their disobedience, they enter an arena of knowledge that is experiential and it exposes the evil within them and the evil that is around them. So knowledge now can be good or bad. And I think you know all right well that knowledge can be good or bad. It could be used for good or it can be used for evil. This is why Paul comes in Romans chapter 16, and I want you to go there in your Bible, because Paul comes in Romans 16, and he's dealing with this false knowledge. These false teachers, they were using knowledge to bring division in the church. And how many of you know that when Satan brings false knowledge into a family system, it brings division within that family? But we are called to promote the value of knowledge in our families. So in Romans 16, look at verse 17. The Bible says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offensive. Now we know that the context is the church. But he used the word note. Another translation used, a translation used the word mock those who sow division. I think it's time that we mock people in our families. We mock people in the church who got that spirit of sowing division, of creating disharmony in relationships. And then he goes on to say, uh, those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. Notice, contrary to the knowledge, contrary to the teachings, contrary to what God has said. Paul say, mock these individuals. Mock them in the church and mock them in your family. Identify them, know them. And then the Bible say, avoid them. See, see, this is where these uh, Christians who have this false sense of mercy in the church 
And they don't understand that when a person is marked by the leadership of that church, it's not that anybody is trying to control you. They're trying to protect you. They're trying to warn you. Why? Because it's a very subtle spirit. It is a spirit that is very inviting. But it is a spirit that is very cunning and crafty, and you have to be really strong and discerning to be able to identify this spirit. Notice I use the word spirit and not a person. See, we get so emotionally attached to we don't understand that the objective is much bigger than you. God wants to make sure that there is unity because where there is unity of oneness, there is strength, there is power, there is ability to carry out the mission. Then he goes on, verse 18, for those who those for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Paul said they are selfish. They are self-centered. They have their own agenda. They may be among you, but their hearts are not with you. They came with an agenda. Uh, get this, and they will eventually leave with an agenda. And so he said, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceives the heart of the simple. Notice who they're going to deceive. They're going to deceive the simple, the unlearned, the vulnerable, the ones who can go for anything, the ones who don't know how to discern that spirit. He said they're going to deceive them. But notice the strategy. They're going to use deception and they're going to use smooth talk. Hallelujah. They're going to know how to be flattering. They're not going to know how to convince you. They're, not going, they're, going, they're, they're going to know how to persuade you. That's why you don't even lend them your ears. The Bible says avoid them. That means you don't connect with them. That means you don't communicate with them. Why? Because they have a spirit of division. We have it in the church. We have it in family systems. And then in verse 19, now I want, I want you to focus on this. Now he turns back to the believers. He said, for your obedience have become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Notice, I want you to be wise in what is good. What is good? Knowledge. It's good knowledge. And I want you to have God's wisdom with that knowledge. But when it comes to the evil, when it comes to the false teachers, when it comes to the false knowledge of the false doctrine, he said this, I want you to be able to be simple. I don't want you to be able to connect with that. I don't want you to be attracted to that. I don't want you to be able to relate to that. I want it to be like a foreign language to you. Why? Because it is knowledge, but it is bad knowledge. It is erroneous doctrine. It is false teaching. It brings decision. It targets the weak. It tries to lead people away from God's instruction. And then he goes on to say in verse 20, And the God of peace, will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, old man. A a amen. Now, notice this. He connects this group who has false knowledge, who has false doctrine. He connects them with Satan. It is the doctrine of devils. It is seducing spirits. And he says Satan's ultimate end is that he's going to be crushed. He's going to be crushed under your feet shortly. How many know we know the ultimate end of the devil? So what's the point? I want us to understand that knowledge can be bad or evil and it can be used for selfish purposes and it can cause division in churches or families. But there are those who have good knowledge and yet not have the personality or presentation that makes it enriching and encouraging. That's another group now. It, it, it is possible to have good knowledge but you are not a warm person. You don't have a welcoming personality. You turn people off because you are not invited. And therefore, you are not able to enrich the lives of others. You are not able to encourage the lives of others because of your presentation. Even though you have knowledge. Listen to this. And... Uh, Proverbs, let's, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Turn there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 
Remember, there's good knowledge and bad knowledge. There are those who can use it uh, for the wrong purpose. That is the wrong application of it. They don't have the right motives of it. And there are those who could have good knowledge, but they don't have the welcoming personality. They don't know how to make it inviting to people. They're not warm, they're mean, they're harsh. And they're right in our families. And people don't wanna to go to them, not because they don't have the right knowledge, but because they don't have the right heart with the knowledge. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter eight, I'm gonna read verse one through three from the Amplified Bible. It reads like this. Now about food offered to idols, of course, we know that all of us possess knowledge concerning these matters, yet mere knowledge causes people to be puffed up, to bear themselves loftily and be proud, but love, affection, goodwill, and benevolence edifies, builds up, and encourages one to grow to his full stature. Notice, knowledge can be used as a means to puff up. But love builds up. And so when we have knowledge, we got to make sure what vehicle am I transporting that knowledge? How am I making that knowledge available to those within my family? Am I puffed up with the knowledge? Well, they're going to know that. Am I mean with the knowledge? Am I harsh with the knowledge? They're going to know that. And even though you have the knowledge, you are not inviting. You are not welcoming and Paul used this here when it comes to dealing with food that would offer to idols. And then in verse 2 he says, If anyone imagines that he comes to know and understand much of divine things without love, he does not yet perceive and recognize and understand as strongly and clearly, nor has he become as intimately acquainted with anything as he ought or is necessary. In other words, Paul said, if this knowledge is not coupled with love, if he ever learned how to be intimate with God, if he ever learned how to take that knowledge and allow God to anoint him with that knowledge, it puffs them up. It makes them ineffective. In verse 3, he says, But if one loves God truly with affectionate reverence, prompt obedience, and grateful recognition of his blessing, he is known by God, recognized as worthy of his intimacy and love, and he is owned by him. That means that my relationship with God, my fellowship with God, my intimacy with God will shape my heart with the knowledge that I have. And now I have the heart of God with this knowledge. And now I don't just have information, but I have a witness of having the heart of God, having God's agenda at the forefront of my heart. But the good news is God wants his people to be what I call kingpins of knowledge that is good and ultimately used, ultimately used for his glory. God wants us to create family system that value knowledge, that embrace knowledge, that makes knowledge a priority. A family system that just don't tell people go out and get material things and present an image so people can be impressed, but make the sacrifice and become skillful and knowledgeable and have understanding. Why? Because that is something nobody can take from you. And so we have to promote the value of knowledge. Listen to Proverbs 24, 3 through 4, 3 through 6, the book of wisdom. It speaks like this. A house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and value. Proverbs 24, 5 and 6 says, The wise are mightier than the strong, and those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. So don't go to war without wise guidance. Victory depends on having many advisors. Notice, the Bible is not only promoting knowledge, but it's promoting good advice. It's promoting those who have good counsel. You have to have that in your life. You have to have people in your life. Now the Bible tells us in Psalms 1-1, do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. No, we're not to walk in ungodly counsel. We're supposed to walk in the counsel that is in agreement with God's word, the advice that puts God's word to shape that advice so that God can ultimately be glorified. 
In 2 Peter 3, 18, it says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. God want our families to promote the value of knowledge. Biblical knowledge and natural knowledge because we live in a natural world. Promote the value of education. Promote the value of empowering yourself with understanding. That's how we build our lives, build our families, build our ministries, our business. The wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And God is a God who embraces knowledge. You know, knowledge reaching. That's what I call this. If we're going to be able to reach others with the knowledge that God has given us, there are some things that I believe families need to consider. I call it knowledge reach, reaching. First of all, desire genuine relationships above reaping rewards. Don't just have people in your family that you just use. Don't just have people in your family that you just go to where you can get from them. But first and foremost, build genuine relationship with that person. Sometimes there are people who perhaps may not have had a parent in their life growing up for whatever reason and later on in life they connect and then when they connect all they want to do is what can you give me? What can I get from you? Rather than first and foremost focus on let's build a genuine relationship that has nothing to do with material things. Sometimes children want relationships to be built with their parents based on what can you do for me? What can you give me? That is not a genuine relationship. The relationship be, should be priority. The relationship should be above the rewards that I can get from the person. I'm talking about the knowledge that reaches out. Another thing, do your due diligence in reaching out. Make sure you take time to get clarity and facts and understanding. What does this person in the family know? There are family members who have a, a knowledge, but that knowledge is not a professional knowledge, but yet they're trying to prevent the, they're trying to present themselves like they are a professional person in that field. No, no, if we don't know, we got to make sure we connect with resources so we can send people out. Sometimes there are people in family system that they know that certain people lack knowledge. And they take advantage of them and they use them. Another thing is respect their knowledge just as outsiders. Because family people or family members have knowledge, that does not mean you can disrespect them and take advantage of them. Just like if you go out to an outsider, give them that same respect. Another one is be open to advice that requires discipline and accountability. Remember, we're talking about what? When I reach out to my family members, when I'm trying to get knowledge, I understand that they are, they are experts in this field. Field. They are professionals in this field. They have the training, they have the skills, and they have the track record. That's part of my due diligence. I'm not just going to them because they're family members. I'm going to them because they are family members who have the knowledge that I need and who have the right heart to be able to share and impart that knowledge to me. But I must be willing to submit to the discipline and accountability that they may ask of me. Another one is this, be patient and prayerfully pursue the process. Sometimes family members just want you to fix it. They just want you to give them money so they can get out of trouble. But that does not change or transform a person's heart. And so they got to be prayerful and patient that perhaps there's a process that you're going to have to go through in order to learn and develop and acquire the discipline and skills that you need. So when that person is no longer available or no longer here in the earth, you can continue to move on in your life. I'm talking about knowledge that reaches out. And then another one is provide thanksgiving. Don't just think because it's family that they owe you something. But be thankful, be grateful for their knowledge. Another thing is empower others with your knowledge and experience. Once a family member have deposited into you, you need to be willing to go and influence and deposit into somebody else in that family because everybody in the family is gaining this uh, 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 wisdom to know that we want to promote the value of knowledge in our family. And another one is look for ways to glorify God throughout the process. 
I'm talking about when I'm reaching out to family members. Why? Because my family understands the value of promoting knowledge in our family. My family understand the value of using knowledge for good. My family understand the value of being able to create a genuine heart of love that is inviting. So what I know now, people are willing to come and learn from the knowledge of the grace that God has given me to acquire this knowledge. Not only must we promote the value of knowledge in our families, we must promote the value of kindness within our family. It is rightly stated that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. We can have knowledge, but kindness is missing, is a missing ingredient to make now that knowledge uh, uh, something that's not inviting or receptive by others. And so we got to promote kindness within our family system. Too often in our society, kindness is associated with weakness or something that must be presented first in order to be reciprocated. In other words, I'm not going to be kind to you until first you be kind to me. However, kindness is an attribute of God and it is displayed by the early church. It was displayed by Jesus. And we're called to show kindness and to promote kindness within our family system. Listen to Jesus teaching in Luke chapter 6, verse 32 down to verse 35. Listen to what Jesus said. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But listen to verse 35 and 36. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil, therefore be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. He is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. And just as your father is merciful or kind, you be kind also. When we promote kindness in our family systems, we are promoting the attributes of God. We are promoting that which God said will make you stand out as a family. You're going to stand out because you're going to have a standard of righteousness about you. Your family is going to have a standard of righteousness that they are not just going to treat people like they treat them. They're not just going to do for people like they do for them. They're not just going to be kind and nice and respectful to people that are kind and nice and respectful to them. But you're going to promote such a standard in your family that they're going to reflect Christ. That they're going to reflect the grace of God. They're going to reflect the Father which is in heaven. And ultimately that good is going to bring glory to God. You say, well, there's some difficult family members. Well, they're challenging family members in every family. God didn't give us perfect families. God didn't allow us to be birthed into perfect families because he knows that we're not perfect. But listen to what Galatians 6 and 9 say. So let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing. If we don't give up, God don't want us to give up. Hallelujah. Or we may have to set boundaries. We may have to avoid certain people, even in the family. But God said, don't you give up. Keep doing good. Keep praying. Keep believing me that I'm going to make a manifestation of my power in your family. I'm going to bring transformation in your family. Your family is going to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Your family is going to worship in spirit and truth. They're going to give God the glory that's due his name. Hallelujah. So God said, don't give up. Don't develop an ungodly attitude. Don't allow the enemy to make you get discouraged because you're doing the right thing, because you're doing what glorify God. Bible, the Bible say in due season, you're going to reap, you're going to reap the blessings and the reward that God will bring upon your life because he see 
the commitment you have in doing what is good. And so we have to promote the value of knowledge in our families. We have to promote the value of kindness in our family. And the last one is this, we have to promote the value of kinfolk. Hallelujah. I grew up in a generation where the word kinfolk had a powerful meaning to me. And those of us know that that word meant that that was somebody that was a relative, a blood relative, somebody who was part of the family, somebody who we had relationship with, and it could have been way down the line. They will get where they go to the third and fourth and fifth cousin. But you notice sometimes when you go down that line and you find what we call family members who become intimately acquainted, become in relationship, and people tell them, you know that's your cousin, but perhaps that don't work at that level. They figure when it get past the third, fourth, or fifth, they don't, they don't take hold of anything, but, but there was a word that we had, and it was a word that was called kinfolk. That means regardless of how far down the line, it was a word that said that we have a connection within this family. It is a connection whereby we look out for one another, where we work together with one another. And there was a time, and most of us know that, that may be in my age category, where they raised us up to be in relationship with one another, not to compete with one another, not to compare ourselves with one another, but to work together for the overall good of everyone. However, if suggested and supported in, in, in our service, uh, the word of God becomes the light to shine within our families. It is what brings our families together. It is what calls us to be able to know that God has a mission for our family. I believe that God wants us who have the word of God in our heart to be motivators, to be influencers within our families for his richest reward that come through diligent faith. Listen to what the Bible say concerning diligent faith. In Hebrews 11, 6, the scripture says, and without faith. It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We got family members who will tell you that I believe in God or I believe God exists. But we have to go beyond that because the devil know there is a God, but he don't seek him. The devil know there is a God, but he don't worship him. We got to get to the place where we get beyond just he exists, but he exists in me. He lives in me. He has set up his abode in me. In other words, he has deposited on the inside of me his divine nature. I am now partakers of God's divine nature. That is the life of God is in me. The strength of God is in me. The attributes of God is in me. The Bible even said that the fruits of the Holy Spirit has been deposited on the inside of those who belong to God. Now, with our faith, we've got to put that in action and we've got to earnestly seek him. And then in Genesis 12, verse 2 and 3, it says this, God was speaking to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. All of the families in the earth will be blessed in you. All of the families in the earth will be blessed if they tap into the faith that you have in me. All of the families of the earth will be blessed if they understand the covenant God that I am and that I am a God who honors and recognizes faith and obedience. And when that faith is put in action, when they're willing to trust me, when they're willing to stand for righteousness, when they're willing to honor me in that situation, I will honor them, said the Lord, and the blessings of God will be on their family. And I tell you what, when you've got the blessings of God on your family, you don't have to worry about the haters. You don't have to worry about uh, 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 those who come with the spirit of Cain of jealousy. They can't stop you because
because if God be for you, who can be against you? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, when Balaam and Balak joined together and tried to put a curse on God's people. Get this. That's what the enemy does. He worked through paid people and he want bad things to happen in your life. They want to see something bad happen in your life. They're just waiting on something bad to happen. But here's the good news. Even if something bad happened, we still have a good God. Even if I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me. He's with me in the valley. He's with me on the mountaintop. He's with me in the waters. He's with me in the mountain. Wherever I go, God will go with me. Hallelujah. And so Balaam and Balak, they tried to curse God's covenant people. And all of a sudden they got a revelation. That which God has blessed, you cannot curse. When God's blessing is upon your life, you don't have to fear what others may desire or what, may they, what they may try to do. Because God will always show himself strong in your behalf. And so family matters to God. God cares, God is concerned, and God is committed to those families who's willing to honor him and take his word and let his word shape that family. How that family handles matters, how that family conduct their affairs. God is looking for that kind of family in the earth so that he can use for his ultimate glory. We that are in the family of God, now we enjoy the citizenship not only of being in America, but our citizenship is in heaven. Hallelujah. We got the blessings of heaven working in our favor, even also the blessing that comes with being a citizen in this country. We can begin by promoting the value of knowledge. We can begin by promoting the value of kindness, and we can begin by, vote, by promoting the value of kinfolk within our families. And once we do that, God will balance the books, and God will make the difference, and God will cause our families to be shaped in the earth for good and ultimately for his glory. We've been teaching, this is the fifth lesson on Family matters. And I want to encourage believers today. God didn't just save you so you can get to heaven. God saved you so that he can build his kingdom, cause his rule and reign to be in your heart. So his word can be planted in your heart. And so now right there in that family that you were born in, right there in that family, God wants to use you to be able to have influence. And the greatest influence we have is our intercession, our prayers, that God's power may be released and manifested throughout our families. I wanna close with a few faith action questions. The first one is this, where can you begin in promoting knowledge within your family? And I'm not talking about just spiritual knowledge alone. That is first and foremost. But we have to promote a desire to have knowledge, skills, and understanding and how to live in this natural world that we're in. We got to promote education within our families. We got to encourage it. We got to talk about it. We got to begin early when our children are first born. Begin to let it be a conversation within the house. Even if you never uh, graduated from high school or you didn't graduate from college or you didn't get a master's or doctorate. That doesn't mean you can't have the conversation and promote it within your family among your children while they're still in that first grade, second grade, third grade. Begin to read to them and show them pictures of, of great people who've done great things for the glory of God who look like them. There are a lot of pictures where they can look at people who look like them and have done great things. But we got to promote and we got to value knowledge within our family. Another thing is, how can you help shape a spirit of kindness within your family? I believe it begins with us. 
Again, kindness is not weakness. Kindness is not letting people just walk over you. Kindness is not letting people just take advantage of you. That's not kindness. That's foolishness. But kindness is an attitude of the heart. That even when I have to be firm and even when I have to be direct, there is not a mean spiritness about me. Satan is not using me at that moment. I'm still under the influence of God. I'm still walking in the wisdom and counsel of the Lord. But I'm having to speak the truth in love. I'm having to stand for righteousness. And God is honored in that. Kindness is not compromising. Kindness is being able to allow God's love to control you and your emotions and your attitude and being able to speak truth in various contexts. The last question is, what values can you promote through the language of kinfolk within your family? Remember I said kinfolk had meaning in my day and time. And it meant that when we were family, we didn't take advantage of one another. When we were family, we worked together. When we were family, even in among the siblings, how we were raised. My mom had nine children as a single parent, raised all of us. And not one time did I feel like I was less or better than anybody else. She knew how to balance that. She knew how to find who had certain abilities and she knew our personality. She knew our strengths and weaknesses. She knew who she could depend on for certain things. And one thing that she encouraged and always held us accountable to is not to put one another down. Some of us remember there were certain words we could not even say even when we were upset at our siblings because that was off the rule chart. What was that part of? That was part of family. And so we got to look at how can, how can I promote that language of family, of kinfolk within our family. Well, I want to thank you for gathering with me around the table of truth. And uh, I, I pray to believe God that he will give me the wisdom to be able to have the conversation because God wants us. And sometimes Christians get saved and think the church family is the kingdom of God. It is the family. It's the family we're going to live eternally with. And uh, those who are in our family, our natural families who are born again, they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They are not just our natural brothers and sisters by blood, cousins, nephew, niece, or whatever the case may be. But when they come in Christ, they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're on a different level now. We're in a different family. We're in a family of God. But I believe God wants that relationship, being in the family of God, to have influence in the families of the earth. And that's how we get to bring his light and cause it to shine within our families. I want to, uh, an announcement is uh, next Sunday, third Sunday, Word Alive, you know what that means. That's our mission Sunday. We call it Warfare Seed Sunday, where we sow not only into this ministry with tithes and offering, but we give beyond that and we give into mission. So that's on third Sunday. And I want to thank all of you, uh, Word Alive members, for the way you have given expression of your love to Lady Curley and myself as we celebrated our 31st marriage anniversary. And this year, God inspired on our heart, and I shared this in the end service uh, uh, last Sunday. God inspired on our heart that uh, we're going to take the love seed that you shared, sowed into our lives for our anniversary. We're going to pray it forward. I didn't say pay it forward, P-R-A-Y, pray it forward. God laid these particular children on our heart, and we're going to take that seed, and as you bring it into our hands, we're going to be conduits, and so you're going to get to sow not only in our lives, but beyond our lives, and to these children who have needs, and we want to minister to those needs. We want to minister to their families as uh, we connect with a local charity right here in our city, and we're going to take that seed and cause it to go beyond ourselves to others who we believe will give thanks unto God for your faithful seed. So again, we want to thank you for your acts of love and kindness. Well, I know you've been blessed by the word of God, and I know you've been blessed by this series of teaching. We want to encourage you to go on Facebook, our website, Word Alive SC for South Carolina, SC.com. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and you can look at these videos and continue to go back and hear the first lesson, second lesson, third, or fourth, and fifth. It's a series of teaching we've just uh, uh, concluded on family matters. And God, regardless of condition of families, there's nothing too hard for God. And I want you to remember that. All things are possible to them that believe. We're going to have to start walking by faith and not in feelings when it comes to our family. Because God has a purpose. God has a mission. 
You and I did not get born again just so we can stand out and shine in our families, uh, uh, but we want to be able to have influence for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. Well, God bless you and have a great day in Jesus' name.